everyone, it's such a pleasure and honor to be here with you in February 2024. Um, launching into this edition of Living Histories with Professor Lauren Huff. Um, Lauren, uh, we are dying to hear about your many and varied histories. Please take it away and tell us about Living Histories. Great. Thanks a lot, Sri, for inviting me. Thank you all for inviting me and having me. Um, I actually wanted to first start with a land acknowledgement. So I, um, as you can see at the bottom, I live in uh, Boulder, Colorado, which is um, distinctly stolen land. So it was actually stolen, um, uh, what do I really want to say about it? Anyway, the land was stolen and the people who stole it um, participated in the single largest, the one single day largest massacre in the history of the genocide of Native Americans and then donated a bunch of the land and money to the founding of the university. So the history of the university is intricately tied to um, the uh, uh, that genocide, and I think that's important to acknowledge, and it's caused um, really devastating impacts on those communities. Uh, it is, oops, sorry, there we go. It is, however, a very beautiful place. You can see the mountains um, just behind the university. So this is the oldest building on campus with the mountains right behind them. Um, okay, I didn't grow up in Colorado at all. I grew up, oh, sorry, let me, yeah, go here. So I, I do somewhere sort of halfway between biophysics and biochemistry at this point. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit about how I got there. And um, so, um, but also in my job right now, I actually have spent half my time doing administrative work at the university. And so I thought that I would give a history that didn't just include the science of how I got to the science that I'm at, but also a little bit about sort of my history in terms of my sort of commitment and focus on diversity work, because it's something I think that's not always talked away about as much. Um, so right now, this is sort of like maybe the sort of punchline at the end, but I work on intrinsically disordered proteins, tubulin and the sheet terminal tails. And I primarily use NMR spectroscopy, though we do some amount of other things, including theory and computation. Um, and then at the diversity level, at the I actually have a half-time administrative position, so I have replaced my teaching with administration, and we have some grants and some different sort of things that we're working on involving mentoring. Um, okay, so how I got here, um, I grew up in Sacramento, California, which is sort of a forgotten big city in California that's halfway between San Francisco and Lake Tahoe, playing in the mountains and... Um, enjoying there. I, I I went to, you know, given how I'm not actually that old, it was a very sexist, basically elementary school. Um, and then my high school is like just a classic textbook case in structural racism. So the rich white and Asian kids um, in their advanced classes got rooms with air conditioners and the, um, you know, black and brown kids in the not advanced placement classes got um, rooms without air conditioners. And Sacramento is a hot place. This is not actually a reasonable thing. Um, it turns out that Cornell West, um, the sort of African-American history scholar who's fairly famous, actually went to the high, same high school. Um, and actually, when I was in high school, he came back and gave a talk. And he he just like sort of laid bare the structural racism of my high school and the ways in which this was disadvantaging people. And and I had already been doing some amount of um, actually like volunteering um, with kids um, and things like that. But it really sort of, you know, motivated me to do a lot more. And it sort of continued as a trend. Um, and, and it's interesting that I, I chose physics, so I did my PhD and my undergraduate degree are both in physics, and, you know, the reasons I got there were actually not all positive, so I wanted to prove some teachers wrong, I had some undiagnosed um, dyslexia, which really kept me from doing several fields, which I would have done, oh, hold on a second, you can leave now, not right now, kiddo, kiddo, no, go out now, sorry, I have a small child who's trying to use their Nintendo, and I just said no, but they knew the answer was going to be no, um, uh, and, uh, but I did really like the quantitative approaches of physics. All right, uh, so how did I get there? Okay, and then I went to undergraduate, I went to Harvard, the, um, I'd still this sort of like undiagnosed dyslexia, memory skills problem, but I just, I really wanted to do biology. I actually started working in a, in a, um, in a snake biology lab. I really love snakes, I had a snake growing up, um, but I just like struggled in those classes because I like just couldn't memorize all the words and I didn't know all the words, but I thrived in my physics classes. So that's sort of what I did. Um, and I did research over the summers at Davis. I did research at Harvard in, in the chemistry department. And then towards the end of my time there, Dave Waits moved there and started the squishy physics talks. And, and you know, I have words on the right, but I don't think it's really important. I continued working on diversity work, doing outreach and, and there was sort of an interesting thing that I'd gone to this massive, huge public high school, but the, and there was all these kids from these elite private institutions, and they just weren't more interesting or more smarter or whatever than my high school classmates. And so I really felt like that was a, you know, that sort of did something. <laughs> oh, okay. 
My other child is playing the trombone. All right. So then I did my graduate work in liquid crystal physics with Noel Clark. And that's where I really learned some biology in a way that was productive and meaningful for me. So I did these bi monthly biophysics supergroup meetings. I did a roughly six months in the lab of um, Dick McIntosh. Um, and also like there I'd been doing sort of activism. I was more focused on opposing the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq. Um, but also just observe significant sexual harassment and racism. Like it was not, you know, once he sort of knew what to look for, it was really, really obvious. And that motivated me to do a lot of things. So I did some amount of activism at that time as well. And then I did a postdoc in the nuclear pore complex, which is a serious crash course in biochemistry, right? So, so I like basically learned how to purify proteins, do NMR, um, do a bunch of different techniques and, and worked on this great problem of the nuclear pore, which is this gate between the um, nucleus and the cytoplasm. Um, and then, and then I took my faculty position. So, um, and I returned to doing um, tubulin work, which I'd done just a very tiny bit of um, using mostly NMR spectroscopy. Um, I did some modeling of the nuclear pore complex. Um, I've largely moved away from the nuclear pore complex as a broader question in part because of some toxic elements in the field. And, but we've since continued to work on intrinsically distorted proteins. Oh, so I should say something about intrinsically distorted proteins. There are these wiggly things in the middle. So like the nuclear pore complex has these big structural elements and then it has this, this filter, this incredibly selective effective filters made up of all um, highly dynamic polymers um, called intrinsically disordered proteins. Um, and so the fact that you could get a selective filter out of floppy things is what drove me to the nuclear pore complex. Um, maybe I should get my kid to play the trombone for you. That would be exciting. All right. So, uh, and the diversity work I did became even more important. So um, I helped uh, mentor a bunch of students. I worked, I helped found and then worked in the physics department diversity committee and then and then um, helped a bunch of students in this really great program where they brought, called the CU Cafe, where they brought in speakers um, to this sort of half. And then I, and then that since relatively recently and just a year and a half ago transitioned to this half-time administrative position where I really, you know, a bunch of the stuff that I did was very frustrating, like it wasn't the right context in which to do it, um, but I was doing it, trying to do it. And this administrative position, I feel like actually, you know, there's amount, some amount of um, efficacy in the work that we're doing. Like we've really started campus-wide mentor trainings that people are taking and things like that. So that feels really satisfying to be in a place where the, the work I do and the things I care deeply about on that level are being um, supported. Um, let's see. Okay. So, so, and, and that, that's basically my history that, you know, my, these histories don't end. And, and I think that something that I really wanted to sort of take this opportunity to point out in part, because I've been doing all this diversity work is just to say that like, if you're not really paying attention, you might not realize how bad things are in this country for many, many people. And so I'm gonna start with talking about that about trans people. So I just wanna put the pictures up here of three 16 year olds who were all killed in hate crimes. Um, you know, one of them just a couple of weeks ago. Um, and, and that you wouldn't be okay with people taking away medical care that's been the established standard of care for the last 30 years from your friends. And so you should just not be okay with people taking away gender affirming care from anybody, kids or adults. And, you know, there's kids in many, many states who have already lost this um, access to gender affirming care. Adults are losing this access to gender affirming care. And, you know, it's illegal for people who, even people who fully pass to use bathrooms in many public places in the state of Florida, for example. And, and I think people think, oh, well, trans people, that's just a tiny little portion of the population. I mean, it's like 1.6 million people in this country. But but it's 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 a form of hatred that is we've seen before. So I just you know put this thing down here, which is that you know in and in, when the Nazis came to power in sort of 1933 and leading up to that, they really focused on abortion and they focused on gay people. It's to the point that in 1935, 80 percent of people in Nazi concentration camps were there for alleged homosexuality. They were gay men, right? So it's the place that people practice. So if you think that like people are just practicing right now on trans people, then you think that it's more, far more serious than you might be taking it otherwise if you don't happen to know a trans person. But this is sort of just more generally, right? Like there's dehumanization happening and more you sort of expansively and thoroughly and vigorously in this country in lots of different ways. So, you know, poor women who don't have the financial means to leave the states that have banned abortion, even with really high risk pregnancies, pregnancies that carry a 10% chance of death. You know, that's that's you you would only take that away from somebody if you didn't really think of them as fully human, right? And and I think that, you know, I know that, you know, there's a lot of people working on this a lot of ways, and there's these big issues, but then there's also just small people issues, right? Like if you're tolerating sexual harassment of your female colleagues, that's also dehumanization and you really shouldn't do it. And and I I have actually a lot of thoughts on why that happens and why people are able to sort of tolerate those types of things. Um, but I think there's lots of ways in which we can do this. And and I think that not 
speaking up on these issues today when so many bad things are happening, you know, when when you can't say the word diversity in the state of Texas, right? You can't you can't talk about slavery in some places. That that's pretty that's complacency, and I think that's a problem. And so, you know, here on the list of right is a list of things to do, and some of them are more explicitly um, focused in different ways. But I, I also just want to say that you know, there's the anti-science backlash, and I think a lot of scientists are stepping back from publishing public engagement because they're like you know afraid of the politics of it. And actually, now is the time to really be engaging in in your community and the research that you do. So that's that's my story. That's my living history, and we continue to move on and try to figure out how to best sort of live in this world that we have. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lauren. On behalf of the audience and the future audience, I am thanking thanking you. Um, thank you for such a powerful and moving talk. It's difficult to know where to begin with questions, but let me try. Um, you you spoke about integrating these different what many people see as different facets of the job, the science and the activism. And you might have heard just as frequently as some of us have, the off-putting phrase, more of an activist than a scientist. Right. Uh, <laughs> so my question to you uh, is, did you make any specific choices to avoid being typecast or to be seen as a whole person the entire time? even when you did not have the permanence of job that you have now, how did you challenge the status quo when your own position was somewhat more precarious? Um, no, I mean, it's certainly true that I speak up way more now than I did before I had tenure. So absolutely, I did less being active and vocal before I had tenure. I still was fairly outspoken and got... And got um, uh, I don't know. I got pushed back for it even then. Um, I, I and you know, there's a lot of stuff that I do. That's there's stuff that I do that's very visible. You know, I speak up. You know, obviously the last two minutes of this talk were me speaking up. But there's a lot of stuff that I do that's less, uh, you know, outwardly. So like I've spent a ton of time mentoring students, right? And those students, you know, there's you don't get pushed back for mentoring at-risk students, right? Like that. That's just a positive thing. And the involvement in CU Cafe. Um, and work on, um, and you know, my, we have, you know, we have fun policies in my lab. Like we don't take um, students who, we don't take students we don't pay, right? So we never take unpaid interns because, you know, people who don't have the means to do unpaid internships don't, can't succeed in science if you do that. And that, and nobody, you know, maybe some kids, you know, maybe some undergrads are pissed off, but the faculty are not pissed off because I take enough undergrads in my lab, right? So, so it's, it's just a matter of, I, I think my first efforts were all matters of finding positive ways to really promote the values that I care about. And I've become more outspoken in some ways, but not in other ways since getting tenure. Um, thank you. A question from the audience. They would like to know a little bit more about your kids. About <laughs> my happened. kids who just came in. Sorry. And I got I got grumpy at them, but like I told them not screen time. Yeah. So I have a nine oh, and eleven. Sorry, year sorry, sorry. The second yeah. part of the question is uh specifically how you find a balance between work and family. Yeah. So I have a nine and eleven year old and I find it very difficult. So I am very deeply involved in my kids' lives and I um, you know, I spend a lot of time with them and I love them dearly. And I think that the the the, I think it's a problem of the field that we expect people to choose one or the other and not just have reasonable work-life balance. And I think that we exclude people from the field because of it. And I think we should all get better at it. And and the pandemic really changed this. I used to work way more hours than I do now. And now when I have, you know, when my kids are free, I'm free, right? And 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 I take that time with them. And it it is hurting me professionally. Like I'm less productive. And and you know, they're 9-11. They're not going to be in my house for so long. Wow. Um, last question. This is relating to the mentoring aspect of what you highlighted. Um, you touched upon this in a previous answer, but I want to specifically ask you in the context of how you, uh, you know, framed the issue as not dehumanizing anyone. Um, and that's the difficult part of figuring out trade-offs. So often one person's mentor is another person's toxic person. Um, and in this kind of human, um, human to human interaction, where 
the rules are not immediately clarifying. How do you navigate um, being in a position to somehow keep the humanity in focus while also making progress? Well, okay, so I'm not really sure I totally understand your question. So your question could be one of several. One is like, diff it's just true that different people are successful advisors to different people, right? Like, you know, there's mentoring relationships that work and don't work that just have to do on personality differences. And so I think the one thing that's important is understanding like what each individual's strength as a mentor is and what each individual's strengths as mentees are and how to match those. I, your question might also be like, you know, some people really, really thrive in getting pushed really hard and some people really suffer from being pushed really hard. And how do you, and how do you get that balance kind of better? Right. Is, is that, maybe that's more your question. And. Uh, uh, go, go ahead, go ahead. It's it, floor is yours. You can interpret yeah. it. Yeah. And, and I think that that, like, I think that's just a matter of really listening carefully to what your students are saying. Right. Like I had a student who like, basically told me she wasn't gonna be able to finish her thesis unless I started actually having deadlines, <laughs> right? Like, you know, she really needed deadlines. I needed to give her deadlines. I gave her deadlines. I mean, I didn't do it that great, but I did give her deadlines. So I think that there's a, yeah. And then I think that there's mentors who are just, I I think that there are mentors who are just toxic. And I think that there's a, a sense of needing and wanting power and things like that that play out in academia a lot. And that those, those things are, are just not good for anybody, right? They're not good for the mentee and they're not good for the mentor because you really are silencing the creativity and scientific productivity of those people when you're just having control of them. So so I, I think there's a lot of things one could say there. Um, any final thoughts before we wrap? No, I appreciate the opportunity to speak. Thanks. Our pleasure and honor. Thank you.